Paul came out of the hospital and mechanically covered his eyes with his palm, squinting against the bright sun. The warm summer weather was inviting for walks, and the hospital yard was quite crowded. The walking patients, who were allowed outside, sat on the benches in the small square and enjoyed the summer heat and fresh air. Paul froze in indecision. He did not know where to go and what to do. He did not even remember his real name. He had been named Paul in the traumatology department, where he had fallen more than a year ago in an unconscious condition with a cranial trauma. He was in a coma for several months, and when he finally regained consciousness, it turned out that he remembered nothing. The concilium of doctors concluded temporary amnesia as a complication of a concussion. They recommended that the patient take more walks, be patient and wait for some place to trigger involuntary associations and his memory to return. Paul recovered quickly and was preparing to be discharged. His clothes he was brought to the hospital were torn and stained with blood, so the doctors taking pity on the poor guy bought him everything he needed and also gave him the address of a charitable organisation that helped people in difficult situations to find work and a place to live. The man walked out of the hospital gate and went to the address written on a piece of paper. He quickly found the church, where he met the pastor and his future colleagues. Paul was lodged in a small room at the church, fed with a simple but hearty meal in the dining room and given a list of duties. The work was not difficult, but it took most of the time. Volunteers cared for the disabled, collected items for the poor and provided charity lunches. Paul went into his work with all his might. Helping the poor and disadvantaged, he seemed to clear his soul. He did not feel his pitiful situation so severely and he even felt happier. However, his memory still wouldn't come back. He went around the entire city, entered unfamiliar neighbourhoods, hoping that a miracle would occur, and his memory would return, but it was all to no avail. One day, Paul met Melanie at a donation centre, where volunteers sorted things for the needy. A slim, petite an incredibly active girl never sat idle. While her colleagues were just deciding how to distribute clothes and toys, Melanie would already be handing neat packages to Paul to load into the car. Everyone liked the cheerful and energetic girl with kind eyes. Melanie was so easy to talk to that Paul did not notice how he was laughing and joking with her. One day, during lunch, the young people sat down next to each other. Paul, what's your profession? asked Melanie unexpectedly. I don't remember. Perhaps an artist? Or maybe a cook? answered Paul sadly. And then Melanie, taking Paul's hand in hers, told him that the employment centre has an opportunity to register for courses and become an electrician. This profession is necessary and in demand, and Melanie advised him to go for it. Paul thanked Melanie for the tip and decided to try. He easily completed the course and immediately got a job with a construction company that did finish work around the area. One day they received a very good contract to renovate a house belonging to a wealthy family in a neighbouring town. Among other work in the house, they needed to completely replace the electrical wiring, and Paul started to work. It was noisy and dusty in the house, where the renovations were in progress. Workers were moving furniture and dismantling partitions, but Paul constantly had the feeling that he had been there once before. Everything was familiar to him, that massive oak table with carved legs and a solid old mahogany cabinet, and even a floor lamp in the living room. Forgetting his work, Paul walked from one room to another, listening to his senses, and gradually 
found himself in a study. He had heard that a professor lived in the house, and then it seemed to hit Paul, a surgeon. Paul looked around the bookcase, where numerous medical books were on the shelves behind the glass. Finally, he glanced at the table and saw a black and white picture in a black frame. Paul looked at the picture, then squeezed his eyes shut and opened them again. No, he was not imagining it. From the photo, a smiling young man was looking at him, who looked like two drops of water like him. Suddenly, the boss, Mr. Bell, came into the office and reminded Paul that it was time to end his walks around the house and finally start working. Who's that in the picture? asked Paul, not hearing the boss's order. That's the owner's son. He's a famous neurosurgeon, and his son died a couple of years ago. His car was caught out in the river, and his body was never found, replied the boss, but suddenly stopped. Wait, you two look like two peas in a pod. Astonished, Mr. Bell asked Paul to stay in the room while he ran to call the owner of the house. Paul sank tiredly onto the sofa and spent some time in that position. Suddenly the door opened and a tall, elderly man, completely grey-haired, appeared on the threshold. David! My son! shouted the man and began to fall to the floor. Paul's brain flashed brightly and he rushed toward the elderly man. Father! Father, what's wrong with you? Mr. Bell called an ambulance, and then he and Paul gently carried the professor to the couch. While the doctors were bringing the man to his senses, Paul sat down beside him and felt his head splitting from the pain and the sudden rush of memories. He remembered that his real name was David and that he was neither a cook nor an artist but a businessman and the son of a famous surgeon, and that his pregnant wife, Lauren, was waiting for him at home. He also remembered the ill-fated evening when everything had happened. His companion, Brian, called him and asked him to pick him up so they could go together to a business meeting. Brian explained that he had had too much to drink the night before and did not want to drive. Of course, David was dissatisfied with such insolent behaviour of his companion, but Brian promised to discuss all the important issues of the upcoming meeting on the way, and Paul agreed. Brian lived in an elite cottage community, and the road to his house went along a winding river through the woods. Brian did look a bit rumpled, but he did not smell of alcohol. Sitting in the back seat, he immediately warned David that he had no energy to talk about business and immediately fell asleep. David was angry at his partner and he focused all his attention on the road. He had felt before that Brian was unreliable and he should have stopped working with him a long time ago, otherwise the business would soon be at risk. At that moment, he firmly decided that after the upcoming negotiations, he would break the contract with him. But he had no time to finish the idea, as he felt a blow on his head with something heavy, and then darkness fell. Brian threw a tire iron under the seat, shoved his best friend's dead body from the driver's seat, and got behind the wheel himself. He was shaking with fear, but he had to finish what he had planned. He drove the car to the edge of the cliff put David's body back in the driver's seat, took the crowbar and pushed the car into the river. He buried the crime instrument in the woods. Once out on the road, Brian walked home. Suddenly the phone rang. So how did it go? asked Lauren, David's wife. It's okay. He's at the bottom. Just don't be nervous. It's not good for your baby said Brian with a smirk. For our baby, Lauren corrected him. Brian hung up the phone and started to think. 
Now the most important thing was not to give himself away somehow. He would have to make a mournful face. After all, his best friend, classmate, smart and athletic David, had died. Who else but him, Brian, should support the inconsolable widow and help raise his son as his own? He also had to take over the management of all of the family's business and finances, as if they were his own. After a while, he will marry Lauren, and no one would ever dare to think anything. The main thing was just to wait a little, and Brian was good at it. True, later, he and Lauren realized that they were wrong a little, because if the body will be found, the type of trauma may cause investigators to ask more questions. But they were lucky. The body was never found. And on that terrible day, David came to his senses because of a terrible headache. He felt that he was drowning. Gathering his last strength, he got out of the car, which was already filled with water, and the river current carried him far downstream. When he finally felt ground beneath his feet, he somehow made it to shore and immediately lost consciousness. He was found by fishermen and driven to the hospital. Thus, David found himself in a completely different region, and thus there was nothing there that could bring back memories of the past. Professor regained consciousness and looked at his resurrected son for a long time, not believing that he was real. Finally, he gathered his courage and told him that his wife Lauren was going to marry Brian. The father also added that she wanted to give her son another last name, but he wouldn't let her. You're a good son, David, but unfortunately I see him very seldom, the old man added sadly. After some hours of speaking with policemen, David went to his house, where his wife, former best friend and son Max lived. David was happy to have a son, and he did not care about anything else. When he entered, Lauren and Brian were arguing loudly. David stood and looked at these people, whom he had once trusted immensely, while they sizzled each other with hateful looks and did not notice anyone around them. Suddenly Brian turned his head and froze, and by his stunned look, Lauren realized who had come to their house. She turned around and collapsed on the floor, unconscious with horror. The police entered the house right after David, and in the total silence, all that could be heard was the click of handcuffs. But David was no longer interested. He went up to the second floor, to the nursery, and saw the adorable baby sleeping in its crib. David leaned over the baby, and then suddenly, Max sleepily opened his eyes, looked at David, and smiled at him with his angelic baby smile. Soon, Brian and Lauren were tried and punished to the fullest extent of the law. Even the presence of an underage son did not protect the woman from imprisonment. David took full responsibility for the baby. He became very attached to the boy and decided that he would be a real father to him. Sometime later, David proposed to Melanie. After the wedding, he brought her to his city and found a help center for people in difficult situations. Melanie supported her husband in everything and became the head of this organization. Due to her character, she successfully combined the role of a competent boss, a loving wife, and a gentle mother. And Max's first word was Grandpa. The delighted professor laughed and wiped away a stingy man's tear of joy.